Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Verónica Vascones. Good morning. I am Verónica Vascones, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on the institutional strengthening and transformation of the ministries of finance in Latin America and the Caribbean. First, I would like to thank all of our panelists, regional experts, regional government officials, and members of academia joining us today. Before starting, we have some instructions for your participation and for the conduct of this webinar. This conversation will be in Spanish and simultaneous interpretation into English, French, and Portuguese will be available. In order to change languages, please click on the globe icon in the lower part of your screen and choose your preferred language. Throughout this event, you may ask questions, for which all you need to do is click on the Q&A in the lower part of the screen, stating your name, country, institution, and who your question is intended for. Questions will be put to the panelists in the Q&A during each panel. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Richard Martinez, Vice President for Countries of the Inter-American Development Bank. Thank you very much, Veronica, and warm greetings to all those joining us today in this fruitful workshop. And of course, greetings to the colleagues at the bank, at ECLAC, and the officials from different countries, greetings from AFI. It is truly a privilege for me to take part in this reflection forum on the transformation and institutional strengthening of the ministries of finance in our countries. And of course, to have you join us. Analytical studies such as the one being presented here and this um, reflection forum of um, a high level such as this one allow us to look at the institutional challenges faced by finance ministers in the region and to strategically plan which way we want to go. As a former minister of the economy and finance, to me it's quite clear that the primary focus of attention should be on economic policy. But given the pressing and tough situation our economies go through as a result of COVID should not make us lose sight of what is important, charting a path of institutional reforms that also within institutions, specifically ministries of finance for them to advance and strengthen a modern and strategic management of public resources. That is the subject matter of today's conversation. And there are three modern capacities that ministers of finance and the related institutional architecture should uh, uh, include. And this is dealt with in the IDB ECLEC publication. And this is particularly important nowadays. First, the capacity of ministries to conduct a rigorous evaluation of budgetary management. Improving the efficiency in fiscal spending is one of the major pending assignments in the region. A former publication of IDB shows that about 4.4% of the region's GDP is lost due to spending inefficiencies. This uh, challenge is all the more pressing now that we need a smart fiscal consolidation process. In order to deal with this issue, ministries need to have a greater capacity for monitoring and evaluating budgetary management and thereby identify areas for improvement in the allocation and execution of spending. 15 ministries of finance in the Caribbean have introduced these functions in their day-to-day -day work. However, in most cases, the function remains very basic and further reforms and analytical tools and data and rigorous data access are needed to evaluate results and link objectives uh, to spending in public programs and uh, of course, impact indicators in development. Thirdly, the ability of ministries to manage fiscal policy transparently, leveraging the opportunities of IT. The region has made a significant effort in publishing statistics on public finance, but few countries have achieved an advanced level in terms of having specific disclosure rules. Several countries in the region have also advanced in applying uh, special rules to prevent crime. For example, the anti-bribery um, 
ISO certification, although there's still a long way to go. Also, the accelerated digitalization boosted by the pandemic may be a great ally when it comes to enhancing transparency. Technologies such as blockchain and artificial intelligence tools, to name but a few examples, facilitate interoperability with regard to data uh, across government agencies. Also citizen monitoring of budgetary management and also the uh, monitoring of public procurement. We have priorities identified in the 2021 vision and all of you can count on our support throughout this process. Third, the IDB act like publication presents evidence on the capacity of ministries to manage risks and to implement a counter cyclical fiscal policy. During the last decade, several countries in the region have implemented institutional arrangements and instruments to enhance the intertemporal management of spending and of income. For instance, several countries in the region have advanced in creating fiscal rules, independent fiscal councils and sovereign funds. However, out of 13 Latin American countries that have fiscal rules, only five have rules that effectively enable a counter cyclical management of public finances. I think having this diagnosis is very important since it helps us reflect on critical action areas for the sake of modernizing our uh, ministries of finance. We talk about strengthening evaluation functions to improve the quality of spending and help create the necessary fiscal space for reactivation and long-term recovery. We also talk about working towards greater transparency and digitalization in the management of public accounts, areas of vital importance for the credibility and trust of citizens. And we talk about the institutional structure with regard to the management of fiscal risks and contingent liabilities, a major pending assignment in the region. And one final point worth noting is that there is a critical point for modern management of ministries of finance, which has to do with um, reaching out to citizens, communication. If ministries of finance fail in terms of explaining to people where we are and where we want to go, it'll be hard for us to muster the support we need to rise to the huge challenges faced by our portfolios at, and departments. At the end of the day, it's about credibility. A communication strategy should be at the center of what we do not necessarily just for citizens to support our decisions, but for them to understand why we make those decisions. I'm sure that this publication and the dialogue that will take place during this event will allow for the sharing of ideas and experiences to shore up the work of ministers of finance, as well as the strategic performance, the modernization, and thereby development in the region. So welcome all. Thank you very much to our Vice President for those welcome remarks. I would now like to give the floor to Moises Schwartz, the Manager um, of Institutions for Development at the IDB. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to join you this morning to look at the institutional evolution experience of ministries of finance in the region. The importance of this analysis lies in the fact that countries that have enhanced the quality of their institutions have achieved better results than those that kept weak institutional frameworks. Nowadays, consensus has been reached on the role that the quality of institutions has in terms of prosperity and economic development. And an important part of such institutions from fiscal management to economic management rely on functions performed by the ministries of finance. In this study we are presenting today with ECLAC, we take a new look at the institutional structure of ministries of finance, not in terms of the policies they implement, but rather in terms of the organizational foundations that ministries use in order to implement the policies. The study offers an analytical framework to understand the organization and functions that ministers of finance have developed to support the implementation of policies aimed at strategically controlling and managing public resources. Therefore, a first contribution in the study is presenting various models adopted by countries in Latin America, as well as the trajectories followed in order to move towards more sophisticated functions. 
Another contribution has to do with explaining the functions that help take the functionality of ministries from the control of public resources towards a more strategic management of resources. So it'll be crucial to improve the allocation of public resources, better prioritize programs and spending, and deal with the uh, region's economic recovery needs. The multiple challenges that 2020 left us with and that we still get to feel in 2021 show that the road to economic recovery in the post-pandemic era will require more than ever strong economic institutions that will help our countries get back on a growth path against a backdrop of higher spending, more debt and lower income. Therefore, examining the reforms experienced by these institutions, the way this publication we are presenting today does, is an opportunity of particular significance as part of our wish to work towards the strengthening of the institutions of our ministers of finance. As our vice president for countries rightly pointed out, ministries of finance play a critical role in the development of our countries. And in this regard, their strengthening and modernization are strategic in order to improve the design, follow-up and evaluation of public policies uh, pursued by our governments while optimizing the quality of spending in order to improve the quality of life of our citizens. We hope that this study will provide elements to facilitate decision-making by public policy makers in the ministries of finance in the region, helping them strengthen and carry out key functions in order to go from control to the strategic utilization of public resources for development as reflected by the title of our publication. Likewise, we hope this event will be an opportunity to share from the perspectives of the experiences of several countries with regard to progress made and challenges met with regard to the transformation of ministries, allowing us all to learn from that knowledge and to have better tools to ensure that the institutional reform efforts are more productive and have greater impact on the development of our countries. In this regard, I would like to invite you so that through this publication and through dialogue, we may begin to look at the best strategies to support the efforts made by ministers of finance to strengthen their much needed uh, functions and capacities for economic recovery. Finally, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all participants for making this meeting possible and, to, and also for helping us carry out our um, structural reform efforts for the benefit of our region's institutions, which we'll hope will bring better quality of life for citizens in Latin America and the Caribbean. So a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much to our manager for those welcome remarks. And before starting our first planned panel, we would like to convey warm greetings to the ministries, secretaries of finance, vice ministers and other officials and regional experts who are also joining us as participants today. We will now begin our first session during which we'll present the co-publication between ECLAC and IDB on the transformation and institutional strengthening of the ministries of finance in Latin America and the Caribbean, moving from institutional control onto the strategic utilization of public resources for development. I'd like to give the floor now to Lea Jimenez, the division head uh, at the um, Innovation Citizen Services Division. She will moderate this panel. Uh, good morning. Thanks uh, to all of you for joining us for this uh, forum for reflection and sharing of experiences on the transformation and institutional strengthening of the ministries of finance in the region. As rightly pointed out by our vice president for countries and by our manager for institutions for development, the global economic situation and in particular the regional situation requires that we strengthen our efforts for institutionally strengthening our ministries of finance. The experience in the region is diverse and all of our countries are on this path towards a strengthening of the institutions, facing a variety of challenges as part of this process. And against this backdrop, it becomes particularly interesting and necessary as well to understand how the regional experience 
as uh, compiled and rigorously systematized in the study that we are presenting today with ECLAC, um, characterizes process in each country. This understanding allows us to analyze the current status of the uh, functions allocated by the uh, applicable rules to the institutions and two functional models are proposed by the model, one based on traditional functions and another one on modern functions. We believe the analytical framework presented in the study we present today is vitally important as it allows us to measure institutional development levels and identify gaps in management models to understand good practices and to chart roadmaps for effective and efficient institutional reforms. In Latin America and the Caribbean, institutional development of ministers of finance is a scarcely um, studied and systematized phenomenon as far as the academia and international organizations are concerned. So we are proud to be able to present the um, IDB ECLAC study, which is a starting point for the uh, design and application of an, an analytical framework with regard to the management levels of ministries of finance in order to analyze functional evolution. We hope this study will be a tool for countries in a region to identify gaps and strengthen institutions with functions that will allow better planning and um, projection of public finances with more strategic management and better quality in public spending, strengthening fiscal responsibility and sustainability, and ensuring the financing of the uh, state's commitments for the medium and long term. These institutional changes are no minor challenges for our country since they often require structural changes ranging from uh, regulatory reform to the uh, creation of skills among the uh, workforce and also the acquisition of technology to refine management. This requires investments on the part of governments in the short and medium term. This could lead to more sustainable policies and to with greater impact for the citizens in our countries. I would like to also I uh, commend the uh, co-authors of this publication, Alberto Arenas and Edgardo Mosqueira, who are joining us today as panelists. We'll start this panel with a presentation by the authors on the findings, conclusions, recommendations, in connection with this uh, co-publication between ECLAC and IDB, and we'll then move on to a discussion and a round of questions on the presentation. Alberto is a former Minister of Finance and Director for Budget at the Ministry of Finance of Chile with over 18 years experience at the ministry and is now the Director of the Social Development Division of ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And Edgardo is a Minister at the Presidency of Peru and Dean of the School of law of the Peruvian Applied Science University and currently coordinates the public management cluster at the um, institution division of the IDB. Before giving the floor to Alberto and Edgardo, I would like to remind you that you may ask questions by clicking in the Q&A section in the lower part of the screen by stating your name, country, institution, and who your question is intended for. And the questions will then be conveyed to the panelists at the end of the panel. Edgardo and Alberto, please go ahead with the presentation. Thank you very much, Leah. First of all, on behalf of Alberto and myself, I would like to thank all contributors to this study. The majority of guests have had a role in order to help us help with this study and reach these results. If we examine the first slide, you will see that the intention of this study is to propose an analytical framework of the functional models of ministries of finance. Alberto and I came up with this idea a couple of years ago when we were working to help the Ministry of Finance in Ecuador when they started a reform several years ago. When we realized what were the types of functions that the Ministry of Finance was trying to implement, we brought up the experience of most countries of the region and the countries of advanced economies to see which would be the best strategies to implement. And 
as we were studying what happened in several countries, we realized that there were certain trends, certain trajectories, which could eventually not only be presented in an organized fashion, but could also help us to derive some lessons as to how the governments had somehow been able to implement better reforms regarding fiscal sustainability and economic development. This is how this idea came about, to design an analytical framework of the models of ministries of finance and to examine the regulatory functions. Basically, the first important outcome was this evolution from a number of functions which were meant to the execution of the budget to another group of functions where the ministries of finance are trying to think about a strategic management of public resources or a study that were was carried out by the IDB a few years ago, which was called an intelligent uh, expenditure. This study tries to establish a distinction between what is the existing capacity and the capacity that needs to be created. Many ministries have certain functions, but they are still not used because they are lacking something. The study was basically inspired by a very old study by Professor Alan Sheik, which was prepared in 1996, where he studied the impact of functions and management tools in New Zealand in order to strengthen the strategic capacity of the Ministry of Finance. Moreover, that study somehow is in reply to a paper published by the New York University in the Public Service School, where basically it is stated that the financial function of the state has to become an open system that interacts effectively with the sectorial public policies, and it should have an influence on government decision on political decisions and the management of results. In the next slide, we shall see what are the contents of this presentation. The first subject that we're going to present is about the functional uh, elements of the ministry. And the second subject matter is related to the boost that the pandemic has given this effort, as Richard mentioned. The third one describes the proposal of the analytical framework, and the fourth and fifth issues describes the functions that we call traditional functions and the modern functions. Can we please go to the next slide? Next. And the following one. When we examine the evolution of the ministries of finance since the 80s, we started examining what happened with the countries of advanced economies. In the 80s, uh, as you know, the development of new public management was the important matter. And one of the important goals was basically to guarantee that the results the government was hoped for would be attained. This is how a series of functions and tools were developed so that the execution of the budget would be limited with the measurement of results not reach to Latin America. This is the beginning of this idea that this uh, management of public finance should have a much more strategic vision. In parallel, we have fiscal functions with functions that are directed towards obtaining stability, strengthening budgetary functionality, and also arrive at a sustainable fiscal 
aspect. In 97 and 98, there were a series of ideas, uh, ideas from the IMF, the World Bank, the IDB, and ECLAC as to how to make progress in stability fiscal stability in the region. And at the beginning of the 90s, the IDB gave a boost to what we call the traditional functions, which are centered in the execution of the budget to a more modern uh, functions, which are meant to strategically manage expenditure. And that is what was called management by results. And this was something that occurred at different levels in Latin America. Because some actors were not there. For instance, there were some crises. There wasn't sufficient capacity in the ministries to guarantee the results. As of the year 2000, we there was a very strong push for sustainability and a series of tools were added to the functions of the ministries of finance as the multi-annual programming of expenditure the assessment of the quality of expenditures and others taking into account this modern functional model we will be referring to if we go to the Following slide, please, Alberto. Perfect. Can you hear me? Good day to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here sharing this presentation. I would very quickly wish to thank for this invitation to participate in this IDB meeting. And I would especially want to greet Richard Martinez, the president for country, and Richard Schwartz, and Anne Jimena, who is the chief of the ICS division. It has been a visionary person by supporting this effort by ECLAC and IDB to support the transformation of ministries of finance. The pandemic has given a boost to this transformation. This health crisis and social and economic crisis of COVID-19 has become in an event without precedence for Latin America and the Caribbean, and the role played by the ministries of finance is fundamental. There is a window of opportunity to make progress in this institutional strengthening in order to develop new structures, processes, and functions, as we were saying this morning, in order to face the prolonged crisis in the region. In that sense, the pandemic, as far as figures for this health crisis, the region has had a very important contraction, 7, 7.1% of GDP, and it has required a greater level of coordination by the state public expenditure basically is increasing every five dollars one was being was being spent in the social sector now one out of four dollars is being spent in social matters and this is an important issue which is related to the maintaining or supporting the social protection activities, which is a real challenge. Within this context, the ministries of finance have had a very important role in their institution, their baselines prior to the pandemic was fundamental in order to their capacity to face it because of their fiscal space, and the development of their management capacities and the budget capacity which allowed us throughout this crisis to reallocate resources and basically 
not all countries had the same level of fiscal space and they all had to look for new financing and acquire more public debt. The debt from the year 2019 has increased in 7.7 .7 percentage points. This year is the year with the highest level of debt for the region. Next slide. What have the ministries done? Thank you. There has been a very important activity, as you can perceive in this slide, in the amount of resources that have been devoted, the mobilized resources in this fiscal plans in on average are 4.3% of GDP, which is what we had mentioned in our publication. But basically that was in November, in December, we were already at 4.6% of GDP, and that is very far from the 2.5%, which is required for guarantees of credit. And this effort is continuing in the first quarter of this year. So if we analyze this figure, the efforts would be extremely significant in 2021. And the ministries of finance basically have had to play a fundamental role. To study the institutional transformation is of key importance in order to establish the institutional capacity of the ministries of finance. In this case, in order to implement the fiscal and economic policy, as well as the existence of the nest to establish public policy programs and how to face the pandemic. Edgardo, please go ahead. Thank you, Alberto. And please let's go on to the following slide. What we are trying here is to show the model with which we work. With the model, we have it two types of functional models. One of them is the traditional one, and the other one is the modern one. As you can see, and it is very easy to recognize the 14 traditional functions, which are basically made to controlling the performance of the budget. How is the budget execution controlled? And that all established rules should be followed by all involved in order to contribute to guarantee fiscal stability. But this does not necessarily guarantee, I mean, these functions did not necessarily guarantee that the results expected by the government would be the best and most efficient ones. This is when additional functions started, starting from fiscal rules, the assessment and control of program execution, the issue of input of the public sector, the public procurement, human resources, fiscal statistics, and the use of IT technologies are part of these functional tools. And a very element, important element which has been taken into account and which has become very important is the coordination, articulation, design, and drive for public policies, because as public policies have more complex programs, it is need, necessary to align the roles of all the actors. And in several cases, the ministries of finance have been in charge of aligning these sectors through the most incentive which they have, which is budgetary control. On the other hand, the function of assessment, the control of the budget execution has become more relevant today because when you start examining the recommendations of all multilateral organizations with regard to how to manage post-pandemic expenditure, one of the most important elements is the need to direct expenditure to priority sectors, which means that current expenditure has to be re-examined, see which areas are no longer priority areas in order to direct resources to the new priority areas. This means that there have to be functions which allow to assess programs, assess the quality of services and results, and the expenditures 
created by such programs. And this entails a function that not all ministries have. When Alberto will mention these modern functions, he will present some interesting proof of between the traditional and the modern functions. There is a happy coincidence or correlation between the ministries that have modern functions and have implemented them and what has been their fiscal performance. Those ministries that have strengthened their institutional capacity were those that were better prepared in fiscal terms in order to face the pandemic. If we go now on to the next slide, it describes some of the characteristics of the methodology. The methodology, as Moises explained during his presentation, does not try to analyze the policies. It analyzes the tools that the ministries have in order to implement policies, because policies are sometimes approved. For instance, a policy of assessing the quality of expenditure. But if we do not have people that are capable of preparing these assessments, of using the information, then the function will never work out. So what we have tried to analyze is not only the quality of the policies, but the quality of the organizational chart that will allow these functions to take place properly. So for this purpose, we have done a comparative analysis of these functions and we have created a chart of all the org charts of the ministries in order to compare progress made depending of organization and functions. And although we have done this homologation, we do, we do not pretend to say this ministry is better than another one. What we are trying to do is to show each country in Latin America which is the level of progress in functional development and which is the roadmap that they should take in order to strengthen their capacities. We have looked at 18 countries in the region, basically examining their laws, functional allocations, the institutional structure of ministries of finance, a set of specialized uh, publications on the issues referred to on the slide. And especially important, we have interviewed several dozens of experts and former authorities of ministries of finance, basically, with a focus on asking practitioners what they actually think about the functions listed. Because we didn't just want to uh, list the uh, document, but also the perspectives of those who've been in charge of ministries. And if we move on to the next slide, we believe this methodology offers a number of advantages, as Leia noted. First, it enables a categorization of functions and to have some order to distinguish traditional from modern functions to the extent that both pursue different objectives and thereby realize that if we don't have the modern ones, the objective of much more strategic spending will not be consistent with traditional functions and we must advance towards the adoption of the modern functions. It also helps identify functional gaps in each ministry and each ministry may define its own roadmap in order to assume and implement new functions. It provides inputs to assess the capacity of ministries to implement fiscal and economic policy while laying the regulatory basis for subsequent uh, studies that we've planned in order to go deeper into the analysis of management models. Because it is one thing to have functions that actually operate, and another one is to describe how you're operating. So we are advancing hand in hand with the Ministry of the Economy in Brazil, and I suppose the Vice Minister will refer to this, so as to identify some of the functional models that work well, some management models that work better in Latin America and in some high income countries, so as to 
even be able later on to present to the region in, re in relation to these modern or traditional functions, what are some good examples of implementation? If we move on to the next slide now, Alberto, excellent. Good. Two things before we get into the traditional functions and adding to what uh, Carlos said and uh, Lea also said this at the outset, there is a deficit in the comparative analysis of the situation of ministries across Latin America. And the document we are presenting today, in our view, reflects a first effort to put in place a methodological analysis based on secondary sources, as Edgardo said, sources of information that will offer a comparative analysis of the institutional development of ministries of finance in the region. And in this context, the traditional functions we have identified are 14. We talk about uh, traditional functions and control management with regard to uh, public spending. And also we talk about strategic management of public spending and how we view some countries and ministries in terms of the transition. Out of the 14 functions, there are seven traditional ones, which we have called core functions. We looked at information from 18 ministries and countries in the region. And out of the 18 ministries, what we found a lower common denominator, which has to do with these core functions, the macroeconomic analysis, budgetary issues, fiscal policy, uh, expenditure and income, tax management, um, management of the public treasure, public debt management, accounting, the relations with the central bank, all of that built a core of traditional functions. And there were another seven functions, basically traditional as well, that we termed recurrent because five of them appeared in over half of the 18 ministries, customs uh, administration in 14, bank regulation, securities and insurance in 13 ministries, public uh, company uh, management in 10 ministries, the management of government owned assets in 12 ministries and negotiations and relations with international um, economic or financial organizations in nine ministries. Then there were functions related to social security and prices and rates in several countries that were also entrusted to ministries or other ministries. And then um, these two latter points are spread across different ministries in the countries. On to the next slide with regard to the modern functions. The ones that we have called modern focus on strategic use of resources and using fiscal management instruments and with a focus on the medium term management with a certain optimization and evaluation of public expenditure management within a context of fiscal sustainability, we could say. And in this context, these functions help have an intertemporal view of public finances. So we basically identified seven functions that we have called modern at the finance ministries in Latin America related to fiscal rules and the advanced level of budgetary control management, uh, for example, public supply management, public procurement, human resources, statistics, fiscal transparency, IT applied to public finance, and finally, the coordination uh, arrangement and design, as well as support for public policies. And 10 out of the 18 countries have a certain development in terms of the modern functions with Chile, Brazil, Mexico, and Peru, especially prominent relative to other countries. So they have more modern functions developed at the advanced level. Also Argentina and Colombia 
are in a transition process. And if we take a look at the next slide, the first of these functions relates to fiscal rules and the management of fiscal risks. Basically, this function enhances the capacity of ministries of finance for the analysis uh, and sustainability of uh, public finances. And it should be noted that there are varying degrees of progress in the region through fiscal responsibility, laws, 11 countries have uh, actually gone this way. There are fiscal councils, sovereign funds, and we added the management of fiscal risks and the analysis of contingent liabilities. We didn't just look to see if the country had fiscal rules in place, but we also looked at another two variables. If they had fiscal rules or a certain management of uh, fiscal risks, and those who were at the advanced level had a, an intertemporal setting with fiscal risk units and fiscal risk reports on a regular basis, as well as information on contingent liabilities. Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru stood out in the region in this regard. Moving on to the next one, as Edgardo also mentioned, we did a kind of exercise with the data so as to see which of these countries had some kind of counter-cyclical fiscal activity and policy. If you look at the vertical line, you have the correlation ratio between the cyclical component of uh, actual spending and um, real GDP. And you see that Chile and Peru uh, were not meeting the uh, standard. If you look at the next slide now, the graph shows the uh, correlation uh, ratio the um, between the cyclical component, let's say, and the effectiveness of good governance. So we found countries that in some cases had negative correlations or counter cyclical fiscal policies and the instruments and institutions of these countries very much enabled a counter cyclical fiscal policy. And on to the second function, if we look at the statistics on public finance, this is one of the areas that contributes to fiscal transparency. When you include this modern function, you can have access to fiscal information in a timely and standardized manner, which facilitates decision making while providing significant information for the identification and management of fiscal risk. So investing in statistics on public finance basically provides a fiscal transparency framework, affords credibility and uh, creates trust among the markets, international organizations, citizens, academia, and also helps create financial and economic stability. And moving on to the next one, this is the classification we did of all 18 countries. All countries in the region have statistics on public finances. The thing here was how to classify that. The IMF currently uses four variables in this regard. The general um, data disclosure system, the first one, which is the most basic one, and then it has a general data disclosure system with a national summary. You have four countries, Panama, Honduras, Panama, the DR. They have moved from the most basic to the second level. Then there are special rules for data disclosure. Most countries are there. Eight countries in the region actually are in that classification. And for the last 10 years, both Brazil and Chile have moved to the highest classification in the statistics. And then you can see the links 
between the existence of function models in the ministries like Mexico, Brazil, Peru, and Chile with a higher degree of open budgets, which among other things, based on the correlation we showed, affords a greater fiscal transparency and shores up um, tax revenue, increase uh, efforts. So investing in statistics on public finance can actually offer results, not only in terms of transparency, but also in terms of very specific matters, such as having greater capabilities to generate more uh, public revenue. Thank you very much for that. And we now close the presentation with two major groups of functions. One related to the uh, evaluation of program management, so as to identify the level of functional development. And here we have Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and Peru with a high level in terms of program management. The next slide explains the types of functions or how we identify them across the laws and regulations they have in place. And these functions basically had to meet the uh, spending priority goals, also um, evaluation of results, increasing the cost benefit ratio. These are functions that contribute to the capacity of ministries for program evaluation. And we found a number of ministries that had made increasing progress on this front. The next slides basically present a new function for some ministries, or at least one which has developed gradually over time recently and has to do with two major inputs in public management, human resources and the goods and services purchased by way of procurement. Some countries have assumed the uh, fiscal management of human resources within ministries of finance, like Chile, Brazil, and Peru. Aside from the management of human resources focus, for example, in the case of Peru, they, they have that. Fiscal management, all of the fiscal impact that a greater or lower level of recruitment may have or the changes in the composition of institutions that requires a function within the finance ministry. This essentially offers better control of fiscal rules as well as better control with regard to how human resources spending impacts on fiscal accounts and regarding public supplies some countries have started to allocate to ministries of finance strategic supply related functions peru clearly paraguay is working on that at present colombia already does that so regardless of the procurement functions that may be in a uh, procurement office or distributed across sectors the ministry of finance plays a strategic role in terms of analyzing data and can thereby establish policies as to how to procure, how to purchase, how to deal with the logistics and distribution of assets. So these are general policies applied throughout the public sector and which allow for fiscal savings. If we look at the next slide, another important role in ministries of finance has to do with the increasingly important role of the use of ICTs. Reference has already been made to the possibility of forward-looking studies using data for procurement, but there are even greater tools that are starting to come into use because the amount of data managed and used by ministers of finance can be harnessed to have a better view as to how to um, execute public spending more strategically. This shows the countries with a higher level, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina considerably stand out in this regard. And finally, the next slide shows what we have referred to as coordination, design, and support for public policies, 
which includes coordination with the legislative branch for the fiscal and economic discussion, contribution to the government center, the center of government to coordinate and financially support government priorities in addition to the coordination with the individual ministries uh, in terms of the design and implementation of public policies. The creation of a delivery unit in Brazil is worth noting, as well as the policy coordination committees in Mexico, COSEX, or the National uh, Directorate of uh, Coordination in Ecuador, with an increasing coordination role being played by the ministers of finance. Finally, a few messages we would like to convey. These would be some final thoughts from Alberto and myself and the whole team that helped us prepare this study. First, we think it is essential for ministers of finance to gradually include the modern functions, which are needed to improve quality in uh, expenditure management as a whole, and in order to have more and better tools for fiscal management. It is equally important to ensure that the functions are adopted along with a management model. It's not enough just to um, legally adopt a rule, but to have a management model that reflects the specificities of the ministry and which ensures that the um, rules are um, uh, actionable. And one pending task is to study the management models where the functions have been successfully implemented. And we hope soon to be able to show some interesting examples in terms of how to put in place these functions with regard to organization, human resources, and processes as well. Finally, the transformation and institutional strengthening of medicines of finance, we think is a prerequisite in order for states to be able to enter into new fiscal uh, packs and social contracts to deal effectively with the post-pandemic challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto and Edgardo, for that excellent and comprehensive presentation, which offers a clear snapshot of the contents of this book, which I think will be extremely useful for our countries. We are running out of time, but I would like to ask a couple of questions that have been asked by uh, some of our audience. I think those are important uh, questions, and I would thank you for brief answers. The first question is for Alberto Arenas. During the presentation, countries like Brazil, Chile, and Peru have made important progress in improving their institutional capacity in several aspects, which continue to be the main challenges or gaps as far as this institutional strengthening that these countries have with regard to other countries who have made greater progress, for instance, OECD countries. Lea. Uh, there was a little bit of interference in audio, so I'm not sure I understood correctly. But what is going on with these four countries that are more advanced as compared to the OECD or the most advanced countries? What is the gap that still exists between those countries and OECD countries? First of all, let's state the following. You said it this morning, Leah, we are doing comparative studies, the ICLAC, IDB, and Edgar and the team. What The first thing we did is let us look at the comparative studies of the Ministry of the Region, which have been published during the last 5, 10, even 30 years. And when we carry out the comparison with what is going on in other continents, we are very poor indeed. So. What I would say is the following. When we c compare continents, it is obvious that there is an issue of per capita income develop and so forth. But there is also a debate which occurred much earlier in the development countries in the OECD. And in, we mentioned it in our study. Basically, we do mention that Latin America 
observing the debate and considering the results, not only in expenditure control, but the effects of expenditure as such, that is how we basically started a debate in Latin America and we followed this up. But certainly, when we examine the most advanced four countries, there are still quite a few gaps as compared to OECD countries. And we have to state this. This has to do with restrictions since we are talking to the officials because of the limitation of resources. When Edgardo was talking about the human resources function in procurement, we have been examining what is going on with other countries, but not all countries have proceeded at this speed. And these four countries are still quite far from what is going on in the developed countries. When we compared them with other countries in the region, we see that there is a transition from traditional to modern functions, but there are still very substantial gaps in some areas. And I would say that there is a certain logic or intertemporal uh, idea of how we have to understand how the improvement of public expenditure, not only from the fiscal point of view, but from the viewpoint of what is going on with the design of public policies in our countries. I don't know whether Edgardo wants to add something to it. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Alberto. My takeaway is that it is very important to continue investing in the institutional mechanism that will help us to institutional public policy, human resource, technological resources, and all the other elements that have been mentioned. Edgardo, I would like to ask a question and then we will have to close this because we have no more time, unfortunately. Somebody's asking, is there any heterogeneous proof of the development of ministries in the region. Their progress has been different. How can organizations such as the IDB provide specialized support according to the individual needs of each country and the processes that each country of the region is applying? Thank you, yes. I would like to reply based on the experience that we have at the IDB. Today, we're working with three ministries of finance in great detail. We work with many others, but with three of them, we're working in detail in their functional reorganization. What are we doing? What we are basically trying to achieve is to bring this experience to the management models. We don't only say these are the functions that you need to have, but we say in order to have these functions, these organizations are required. These are the macro processes. These are the specific process, and these are the res human and material resources that you need. Not all countries have the necessary resources, but this can be done gradually. For instance, in Ecuador, we have been working for the last couple of years in the creation of a capacity in order to assess the expenditure quality of public expenditure in Brazil, we have been worked in order to try to strengthen their macro processes, which are quite sophisticated. So uh, our focus and how we intend to focus our attention is to help ministries of finance by showing the models and function so that these models can be adapted to their individual realities. And this is the last uh, thought, which is one of the main lessons taught to us by Professor Sheik as to how ministries of finance function in the world. The most important part is context. If there are no conditions for reform, this is a very important driver, such as now we have the driver of the economic recovery, a clear political decision. If we don't have that, it is impossible to make progress. Those conditions are fundamental and what we are striving to do when we support a country is to make sure that those conditions exist. Thank you so much, Edgardo. Thank you so much to both of you. 
for the presentation. I would like to close this space by thanking you both for this study. And I would like to invite you all to use this valuable tool from each one of our spaces in order to promote effective actions that will help us bolster the efforts of institutional reform in order to strengthen the management of ministries of finance in our region. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our Division Chief Lea Jimenez and our panelists. We have now concluded the first part of our event and we shall now go to the second panel, the institutional advances of the Ministries of Finance, Economy and Planification Planning of our region. I would like to remind you that this is in the web page and you will find a link which will find the right corner of your screen, www.idb.org ministries of finance for those of you with a mobile phone you can ac access this by using your iphones and pointing it to the qr code i now give the floor to camila mejia who will be the moderator for the second panel good day to all thank you so much veronica it is great pleasure from the idb to have you here with us in this webinar. We hope that this will be a space of reflection and exchange of experiences. I would like to welcome you to the second panel today where we're going to talk about institutional progress in the ministries of finance of the region. In the first panel, we had the opportunity to hear Alberto and Edgardo speaking about the lessons derived from the evolution of the ministries of finance and comparing the functions that are assigned to these ministries. And this will be a strategic element to continue closing gaps and drawing roadmaps to the strengthening of the institutionality of ministries of finance in Latin America and the Caribbean. The objective of this panel is to have a dialogue in order to talk to the main characters who have carried out important ref institutional reforms in their country so that they may talk to us about the challenges they have faced during the institutional reform. We will do so in a very special context as we are in the midst of a health crisis, a crisis that has lasted for over a year and has had important fiscal consequences and has had important repercussions on the institutions of our countries. First of all, I would like to introduce the members of the panelists with whom we will talk today. We will first start with the Vice Ministry of Economy of the Minister of Economy and Finance of Panama, Mrs. Enelda Medrano. Vice Minister Medrano has studied in the public sector of Panama and has a master in business administration, a master's from the Autonomous University of Mexico and also a master's from the University of Chile. We also have the vice minister of finance of the Ministry of Ecuador, Fabian Carrillo. Vice Minister Carrillo has wide experience in the public and private sector as well as the academic center and he has a master of the pontificia university of ecuador in chile we also have with us the minister marcelo guarani from brazil secretary guarani has had a long experience in the brazilian ministries and in several international organizations and he's a specialist in economic legal matters of the Getulio Vargas Foundation. We also have the honor of having with us the Ministry of Minister of Finance of Paraguay. He has more than 25 years of experience in Paraguay. He has a master's in economy from the National University of Tucumán. And finally, we have the Secretary of Finance of the Ministry of Finance of Argentina, Raul Rigo. 
This secretary has more than 20 years of experience in several areas of the public sector of Argentina in administration, budget, and public finance, and he has a master in government and public management in Latin America from the Barcelona School of Management from the University of Barcelona. As you see, we will have a deluxe panel for today. And before starting, I would like to remind you that you can send your questions through the Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of the screen, indicating your name, your institution, your question, and who you're directing your question to. We will direct those questions to the members of the panel at the end of it. With these words, I would like us to start. And I think that we have to start by talking with our panelists about the current situation and the very special situation in which we are today and the challenges that are posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has made governments carry out adjustments and changes in order to face the crisis that in its short and medium term effects. Dramatic fiscal decisions have had to be taken by our countries and our countries also had to take, uh, create a series of programs in this emergency context. So the question that I would like to ask is, what institutional arrangements have you implemented in your ministries in order to ensure that these policies and programs which we're implementing have been successful? Which adjustments have you had to make in order to ensure that these policies are a success? And I would also like you to tell us what has this pandemic shown us as to how we have to rethink the institutionality of our ministries of finance? With these words, I would first like to give the floor to Minister Yamosas to hear about the experience of Paraguay. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Camila. A good day to all. My greetings to the Vice President of the Bank, Richard Martinez, our friend Leah Jimenez, Edgardo, and other authorities of the IDB who are participating in this conversation, also to the colleagues of the Ministries of Finance of the region. It is really a great pleasure to have been invited, and I am grateful for the opportunity to share the experience of Paraguay in this very complex situation created by the pandemic, and also the need of transformation, of institutional transformation. The pandemic caught all our countries by surprise, and it required quick reaction to both. It also showed our weaknesses, and this turned the search for quick solutions to these problems more difficult. Telling you about our experience in Paraguay, in March last year, when we heard about the first case of COVID-19 in our country, we immediately took a series of restrictive measures with the objective of protecting the health of the population. We were restricting the mobility of people, social interaction, and this had repercussions in economic activity. By the end of March, the Ministry of Finance became the leader of an emergency plan which had the objective of strengthening the health system in view of the situation to protect employment and corporations and ensure the correct functioning of state. This implied a fiscal practice, which represented 5.7% of the GDP to mitigate the effect of the pandemic on the population, health and social repercussions. We also took other measures in the monetary area in order to ensure a correct functioning of the market. This pandemic has made us boost and drive extraordinary measures, including the execution of the proposals that we made for mitigation, not only the macroeconomic framework, but also the social area. In addition to designing and articulating the measures that were 
adopted, for instance, subsidies to workers, fiscal facilities, subsidies to the payment of basic services, a guarantee fund for loans that we provided. We have been the leaders and we have carried out one of the programs which was called help and it is named with the equivalent of this word in guarantee. Seven out of each worker and it represented more than $50 million. This program was implemented very quickly. In the month of April, we were already creating transfers through new methods to record and to make the actual payment. This required an important technical effort by the Ministry of Finance because at the same time we continued carrying out the proper functions of the ministry. This was an effort which was coordinated amongst different parts of the ministry and this does not occur so easily. Pandemic showed which were our institutional weaknesses and therefore we need to learn lessons and make progress in the transformation of the state. In that sense, in the middle of last year, we started a economic recuperation plan and one of its pillar has an ambitious agenda of reforms through fiscal strengthening with a new law of fiscal responsibility and a better analysis of fiscal risks, improvement uh, business environment and public expenditure. This is what we're doing and in addition to cope with the sanitary emergency, we're trying to make progress in the transformation progress because the efforts that we carried out require institutional arrangements that will allow us to return to a sustainable level for public finances and a sustainable and inclusive growth. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. As Minister Carrillo, can you tell us about Ecuador and the adjustments introduced? Thank you, Camila. Good morning, everyone. Warm greetings to the uh, bank uh, officials, um, Richard Martinez and other authorities and officials. First of all, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about the European perspective. I would also like to thank Alberto and Edgardo for the very interesting work they're doing. I think it is the right way to go in terms of a structural reform that is relevant to the region as a whole. As regards Ecuador, let me first describe the context in our country and how the president's economic program being implemented since mid 2018 has worked and what are the restrictions in or constraints in our economy. Uh, one of the advisors talked about five no's in Ecuador. Ecuador has no uh, significant economic growth since 2015. We have no reserves due to the disorderly populist management of public finances during the previous administration. We have no fiscal capacity, no access to financing, and we have the dollar as our currency. In other words, we don't have our own currency. On that basis, we implemented a comprehensive economic program, which focused on putting the economy back in order, fiscal consolidation, monetary stability, while focusing especially on those who are the most vulnerable in terms of income or access to services. On that basis, we have implemented a set of decisions, which in my view, are mainly based on a very constructive work agenda with the international um, organizations. And I would especially like to thank all multilaterals that since 2018 and 19 have been supporting Ecuador, uh, allowing us to access the resources that our country needed in the darkest hour of its economy. Uh, in the period 2018 to 2020, we've been able to get resources from abroad under the agreements with the international financial community amounting to some $22 billion, uh, uh, $18 billion of which were freely available resources to strengthen the state's uh, fiscal capacity. We have undertaken significant actions like other governments based on the guidelines set by the president 
for his last year in office, focusing on protection of the vulnerable through food, health care, job protection, while also taking care of the dollarization, which is our economy's main asset. And based on that, let me share some views and ideas. The ministry has played a strategic role, as Edgardo said, regarding the management of state relations and interagency relations, also with international organizations, playing a leading role in social protection and economic reactivation. So it has had um, a cross-cutting approach to its work, the ministry. And there have been significant milestones, such as a set of reforms to uh, enhance and optimize uh, public spending using the fiscal space we had and have essentially to address the priority needs of the population, mainly through an annual investment program. And in this context, I just described, it may be worth noting that Ecuador hasn't really had significant impact in terms of deficit. Obviously, it did increase due to the tremendous fall in income by 20% approximately, but based on the agreement with the IMF, the extended facility, um, we have been able to keep a focus on structural reforms while also focusing on social protection needs. Our administration makes a point of protecting the most vulnerable. We don't have major projects or infrastructure projects, but we have been able to protect the most vulnerable, and that's been a key pillar of our government. And in that regard, during the period I mentioned, we had three agreements with the IMF, uh, two extended facility agreements, and another one was a rapid um, financing facility, which allowed us to bring resources into the economy um, during the hardest of times. We restructured a significant portion of our public debt, the one that was held by global bondholders, amounting to some $17 billion, with very significant relief to free up resources for recovery and protection of the most vulnerable. We have also undertaken a reform program at the Ministry of the Economy and Finance, which we'll be able to refer to later. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister Carrillo. I would also uh, ask the same question of Vice Minister Medrano. I believe you're on mute. While the vice minister sorts out the mic issue, I would then like to ask Secretary Guaranese to talk about the institutional arrangements put in place at the Ministry of the Economy in Brazil and the prospects in the context of the pandemic as regards the institutional structure of ministries of finance. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to be with you. I'd like to greet my colleagues from Latin America and the IDB staff. Although uh, I could speak advanced uh, Portuñol, I will speak Portuguese, but I will try to speak slowly. And if I don't speak slow enough, please. Have the uh, Ministry of Economy in Brazil was created in 2019 with what our goal was to join our forces, all the economic areas in Brazil to implement the economic reforms that we deem necessary to change the reality, economic reality of our country. Uh, Valeria is informing, Valeria is informing everybody that we have 
inter simultaneous interpretation into Portuguese, English, uh, into English, French, and Spanish. So we decided to create a Ministry of Economy to implement all the reforms that we deem necessary. It's a huge ministry. We uh, join three ministers, the, the, the economy, transport, the social security, and the, the labor and uh, jobs. So all the uh, areas for economic areas in Brazil could work. 2019 was already a very, very good uh, year for us. We were able to do a social security reform for all the countries. Uh, pandemic hit Brazil in 2020 when we are working to implement the new political reforms and we have to readjust, readapt ourselves in order to deal with the economic impact created by the COVID-19 pandemic. So for that, we click rapidly instituted in the first week of March, a working uh, for a task force or a working group that I was the coordinator here in our ministry with all the areas that could be uh, working with the population that could work uh, implementing public policy that will uh, design to reduce the political uh, or actually the economic impact. For us, it was really interesting to see the capabilities that we have to implement all the political reforms it was extremely useful in the moment that we have to help our population to join forces in all these ministries to implement serious uh, public policies. In a month, we are able to change the, that impact on the population, trying to provide assistance to the vulnerable uh, population, the informal people, the people, the informal workers that didn't have any social security, and we will pain during, during months, uh, cash transfer so that people could survive during the time the economy was in a stalemate. A second uh, package of measures that focus on jobs, employments, and the private sector, trying to increase those contracts so that companies will let people work less hours or stay at home while the Brazilian government was paying half of the salary for those people. This is a problem that we called BEM, which is a public uh, a job benefit, if you will. For us, it was extremely efficient to not to increase the number of an unemployed, allow people to continue linked to their jobs, and then to implement an economic uh, uh, developing when the pandemic was trying to decrease in the fourth trimester of last year. A third group of measures were about measures that would allow us to offer money, resources to all those that needed it in order to um, go against this pandemic. Different ministries, defense, and other ministries working in the pandemic environment. So we structured this group in order to do this work. We make some, made some fiscal rules more flexible for everything that was an emergency so that we could separate what was a normal uh, spending in a normal economy and what was an emergency during a uh, pandemic situation. We had extraordinary expenses last year and we saw 8.5% of the GDP, uh, which was the deficit for last year. We saw this earlier in the panel. So we can see that the situations are different, but we can embark on a recovery afterwards. So this was very useful for us here so that we could find quick responses. Some policies that would usually take months to be designed were designed in days in order to assist the population. The IDB helped us very much in structuring this work. Initially, we asked the IDB um, to help us with the creation of a delivery unit so that we could inform the population and monitor all the policies that were being designed. I believe that our institutional arrangement framework created for our Ministry of Economy was very important in order to deal with the pandemic as well. We were very agile in making decisions and creating public policies, and this was only possible because of the Ministry of Economy. 
the end of the year, the pandemic situation improved a bit. We saw the economy recover a bit, but then we saw the cases go up again. And unfortunately, the number of deaths. So we had to go back to certain policies. We are paying the emergency assistance and we are also working with the labor benefits again. The, this is what I would like to start with uh, and tell you a little bit of what we've been doing in this pandemic environment. We'll now give the floor to Vice Minister Medrano. I think her mic is now working. Hello, everyone, and my greetings to the organizers at the IDB and to the speakers who have described very appropriate framework for follow-up and reference regarding the administrative and organizational activities in the context of this widespread pandemic. I want to be brief in terms of the background, but I would like to say a thing or two about the specificities of the Panamanian economy and uh, our own system, which sets us apart in terms of the basic organization to address the financial situation and the crisis amidst the pandemic we are going through. Let me first say that Panama, since it became a republic in 1903, we, we were born without a central bank and we've stayed like that for 117 years. All other countries, and it's still to, to understand, hard to understand how it is that we can work with the fiscal arm only and no monetary policy arm uh, in the broadest sense. Instead, we have the National Bank of Panama, which is the country's fiscal agent, and which lets us do the related work on the administration and management of financial resources, both in the country and abroad. This over the course of the years in our country has been positive, but of course, the pandemic has had an impact. And according to official statistics, as you will know, one of the largest GDP drops was the one recorded in Panama. But we had already seen lower economic growth in previous years. And the halfway into the second half of last year, when the incumbent president took office, we already had problems with regard to the uh, set income budgets and the actual revenue and collection levels. It took us only three months in office to submit in Congress a review of the um, social responsibility, fiscal responsibility law um, and the fiscal uh, targets, which we would be and would have been unable to, to meet as planned by the previous administration. And when the state of emergency was declared in March of last year in Panama due to the pandemic, the situation was already weak and the public saving had been very substantially weakened and the situation didn't look good and we knew, knew that we had to undertake a reform and review of the income structure right away, adopting uh, income enhancement measures while also reviewing the quality of spending. The pandemic, as others have noted, also 
caught us by surprise and the effects have been very significant and we know that it has left a fiscal mark not only in 2020 but also in this year and this is ongoing and this is important to note because when it comes to the specific measures adopted to deal with the pandemic we had to immediately review available budgets we redirected budget resources significantly curbing uh, spending dedicating two billion dollars to deal with the emergency following the declaration of the pandemic a key priority was dealing with the health crisis and also with public health measures devoting all efforts and resources to ensure health care and monitoring for the population so that reflects the priorities and allocation of resources and it became necessary as was the case in so many countries to halt certain economic activities and to uh, order lockdowns suspend classes in addition to the disruption in the normal operation of business while at the same time keeping essential activities running such as food distribution supermarkets uh, medicines but obviously with limits and the same thing with the banking system the early measures adopted sought to ensure as much liquidity as possible and supporting the budget levels and as we have no central bank obviously the efforts made in 2020 aimed at ensuring the greatest possible availability of resources so the efforts attracted resources from outside external resources and we're looking at nine to twelve percent in terms of external resources and the drop in gdp and in current income in march especially in the first quarter of the year was very significant the consequence of this obviously was the increase in our indebtedness which has been greater in our case but we always try to maintain the possibility of having access to international credit we have issued bonds in the international market and we have obtained multilateral financing we have worked with the institutions and we have designed and established from the social point of view the theme which is called panama solidario in order to help population with the provision of food basic health care and an effort which was deployed through technology to develop mechanisms that would allow us to facilitate the access and to send digital bonds and cash and the and an important effort in organization which we carried out with the national production of food donations in its national distribution and this in order to contribute to help and to avoid that the population should be in need but the important uh, rate of unemployment and suspended contracts also required an additional effort in the sense that we also had to cover the population who no lost their income and this has also resulted in maintain them and support them 
we are still in an emergency state from the health point of view at this time we are in a rather we have a rather positive outlook because the drop in daily contagions and deaths is quite uh, has been reduced substantially but this is a transitional process and panama as well as the rest of the world we are not alone in this we need to contain and make sure that we maintain progress on the health front because from the very beginning we realized that if the pandemic is not controlled we would be unable to return to reactivate our economy obviously I do not want to continue now, but in the next opportunity, I would like to tell you that in order to face all this and face all the challenges that we have going forward, because we are outside the medium term goals, which we had from the fiscal point of view, we had to adjust once again the levels of the so social responsibility law had established in during the second half of 2019 and we had to increase the levels so in 2020 our deficit situation amounted to about 10 percent we are working by strengthening our structures to follow up the budgetary area and also as far as revenue goes we're trying to strengthen collection and with the help of programs with the help of the idb as a financing source and as a source for advice and other multilateral organizations in order to strengthen our structures in order that to work to the recovery of our past levels. And the other issue, which I will only mention in passing, is that the structure of our economy is extremely open and an important part of our revenue comes from international tourism. And the lockdown has had repercussions and has resulted in an important drop. Fortunately, the Panama Canal, which is an important service exporter in our economy, has not decreased. And we it continues to work within a pretty normal framework. There has not been a negative impact on that. So we, we need to work in improving the efficiency in the expenditure because the opportunity cost of the resources that we can obtain are much higher at this point of time. We know that the debt problem is not sustainable in the long term and we are taking care of our international credit rating, but we have to face these challenges, which we share with the rest of the countries, but which are very specific to us. I do not know. I think that I will stop now, hoping that I will be able to speak in more detail about some institutional aspects later, but this is the message I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Finally, I would like to give the floor to Secretary Rigo, who will tell us about his experience based on the Argentine experience. Thank you very much, Camila, for giving me the floor. I would like to greet all the colleagues. I obviously want to thank the IDB officials for their invitation to participate in this conversation. And I really want to thank 
uh, Alberto and Edgardo for their work. It is a fundamental methodological input in order to be able to understand in each country of the region what is the situation and the status of the traditional and modern functions of the ministries of finance and to understand which are the gaps and the tools that we have in order to close the gaps. In the concrete case of uh, my participation, 2020 was a very challenging year. Argentina, as in all countries of the region, the pandemic is still creating problems and difficulties. Nevertheless, in the case of Argentina, as far as the institutional arrangements that the country made in order to face, contain, and mitigate the health effects and the economic effects of the pandemic are related to a political agreement framework, which is important. President Fernandez promoted the active participation of our Congress, not only in identifying the priorities of policies in the health area, in the fiscal, economic, and as social assistance areas, but also in the use of fiscal resources. Our 2020 budget was modified and extended through a law of Congress in order to provide space to all the expenditure, the mobilization of resources. As Edgardo mentioned, uh, Argentina, uh, in the case of Argentina, it was 5% of GDP. We provided fiscal and tax uh, facilities, we provided loans to subnational governments, also provided incentives to the private sector precisely to try to help in this economically stressful situation caused by lockdown of the population. So on the one hand, the change of our budgetary law 2020 with the participation of Congress, which not only provided space for this mobilization of resources, but also for its financing. As you all know, Argentina at that time was going through a difficult situation as far as access to national and international credit and an important part of this mobilization of resources was financed with monetary issuance by the central bank, and this was approved by the National Congress. So one first element as far as the institutional arrangements go, there was a political and institutional agreement. The second element, which was a characteristic of our institutional arrangement was a very deep professional and committed mobilization of the national cabinet, which based on the executive branch guidelines to find measures that would mitigate the health effects everything that we could identify as an expenditure for health, the strengthening of the public health system, the acquisition of all the necessary elements for the medical profession and for all professionals, and everything that had to do with the professional assistance in the health area. The second important element was related to the policies in view of mitigating the effects of economic lockdown on the population and this stress, especially for the highly vulnerable uh, 
sectors of the population, we provided a system called IFE, which was a monthly allocation of money for families during the worst parts of the pandemic. This assistance reached 9 million people. We have 45 million people in Argentina, so 9 million is a very high number of people, and this truly had an important effect as far as containing poverty and extreme poverty. In addition to this tool, we also launched another policy the help to work and production called ATP, which provided uh, tax facilities, subsidies, loans, and other incentives to the production sector in order to preserve the economy and to mitigate the effects of the economy on the most uh, important sectors of the economy that were the most affected ones, such as tourism, trade, and industry to a lesser degree. These were the most important elements of the institutional arrangements that allowed us to go through the pandemic in the best possible manner during the year 2020. You probably know, but if you don't, then I will share with you that during the year 2021, our national budget does not foresee financing for these two programs, IFE and ATP, because we consider that they are emergency programs and they are linked to the worst time of the pandemic. But our current budget does foresee the strengthening of assistance programs, which are usual in our national budget. So an extra priority budget in order to help the vulnerable groups of the population and the vulnerable sector of the economy during this uh, post-pandemic trajectory. Uh, post-pandemic trajectory, which is rather difficult because we have new waves right now in Argentina. We are going through the eye of the hurricane. It's the second wave of COVID. The indicators have grown and show that the situation is complicated. So we are truly trying to mitigate and to reach out to the most vulnerable groups. On the other hand, and I believe that this is interesting, especially in order to take into account the, the comments made by the Vice Minister of Panama, which are related to access to credit. You know that during the year 2020, Argentina renegotiated its external debt. This process was successful as far as the results obtained, the reduction of the interest rates, and this happened together along with uh, the decision to reconstruct the possibility of having a debt in national currency, our country and our economy has been exposed throughout the years to the tensions in the exchange market and the exchange market balance. So we're trying to create the possibility through trust of an internal debt market, which is a challenge right now. And it is another aspect of this institutional arrangement within the framework of the pandemic. We are trying to avail ourselves of the opportunity to establish the basis for a debt market that will allow us to channel the savings of Argentinians towards the financing or the virtual, if I may say so, financing of the treasury and public finances. These would be, in summary, the situations 
which characterize the institutional arrangements made by Argentina in order to go through this difficult context of the pandemic. And a last comment, which I believe is very important with regard to our daily activity, which is the management of different organizations and bodies of public functions in at the national level. We have had to face the challenge of teleworking. This for the federal government became a very important opportunity to realize that from the Secretary of Finance, we had been already driving this in the past 15 years related to the strengthening of all our technological capabilities so as to ensure in a remote manner, in a safe manner, and in a permanent way, the service of financial administration for the entire public sector. This is especially relevant at this point in time when we have the need because an important part of our officials should remain at their homes to be safe, but we should continue providing the execution of the budget and payments so as to carry out the measures that we have to carry out during the emergency and during the post-emergency period. For this end, the work carried out by the Ministry of Finance, for which has been the leader to eliminate the paper and enhance connectivity and the safety of the technological and functional tool has allowed us to go through this enormous challenge preserving the services of the administrative, the financial administration and cooperating with our civil servants so that they could continue to work safely from their home without being exposed during the worst time of the pandemic. I think I could stop here so as to offer other colleagues an opportunity to speak and to carry on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Camilla, as well. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Very interesting. And your intervention triggers the next question. As you pointed out, all of these programs and measures implemented amidst the pandemic were made possible by an institutional reform and strengthening process that was already underway. And in this regard, I would like to ask Vice Minister Carrillo to tell us, the IDB has been working with the Ministry of Economy and Finance very closely in the field of uh, institutional reform. Perhaps, Mr. Vice Minister, you could tell us a bit more about some of the areas that the institutional reform has focused on and adding perhaps the ingredient of the fiscal situation in Ecuador, which you mentioned earlier. How has this boosted the uh, need to strengthen certain areas or has this changed the way the reform has been unfolding. Absolutely, Camila. First, when we set about this reform with your support, the support of the IDB out of ECLAC, in general terms, what we wanted was to go from an operating uh, institution to a leading institution with a strategic short, medium and long term vision in order to then focus on certain institutional priorities relating to the enhancement of the economy component. Let's recall that the president decided to 
include the Ministry of Economic Policy within the Finance Department and the economic advice for public finance management is important in addition to the importance of that uh, leading role. So what was our goal as part of this strategic vision? I will speak about the departments under my charge. We currently have seven under secretariats, which mainly deal with uh, registration or accounting and other linkages with the uh, public sector. What are we essentially doing? First of all, the uh, purpose was not to reduce the ministry, but rather to provide new instruments with a stronger strategic focus, creating a debt office that was duly structured on the basis of institutional standards by merging the Treasury and Public Finance Secretariat based on best international practices, linking this, the flow management aspect as well. Other colleagues have also highlighted the need to strengthen revenue and we planned an under secretariat for fiscal revenue this currently doesn't exist yet but the idea is to have a strategic vision to support the fiscal sustainability process for better management of tax revenue and oil and mining and other revenue as well we firmly believe at our ministry that those who put in place the overall budget shouldn't be the same people that operate or work on the operational uh, front. We think the rearrangement of institutional structures and the re assignment of budget priorities should be conducted strategically. So one cross-cutting theme of the reform is to enhance public spending while optimizing the ministry's capacity with a short, medium, and long-term view. Modern components such as the ones highlighted by Edgardo and Alberto are important. Fiscal risks that is being developed on the basis of structural reforms at the Ministry of the Economy and Finance during the last three years, also working on the respective code. We are strengthening that department by means of the creation of a specific office according to international standards and with this comprehensive cross-cutting approach. We found a very weak and unhinged ministry that had been used by the previous administration as if it had been a sort of ATM, uh, often with no proper priority setting. So we had to rebuild that, put in place fiscal statistics uh, according to the best international practices. This is part of the reform exercise, including the support of the IMF. We are putting in place the uh, public, um, the fiscal policy uh, handbook so that President Moreno may provide clear, orderly, transparent figures reflecting the economic situation of a country, which didn't happen or which wasn't yet available when the president took office. Also strengthening uh, PPPs with delegation uh, between the economy and the finance departments, and also the importance of information security and of strategic data management, ensuring that in the new normal, the way the ministry works is appropriate and allows us to work the way we have been doing without major disruptions. So, Maria Camila, that's what I could say for now. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Carrillo. That was very interesting. And I would now like to ask a question of Secretary Guarniz, because similarly to what Ecuador has done, 
in recent years, Brazil has also set about a number of significant institutional reforms by merging several portfolios into a single ministry. And I think it would be very interesting if you could perhaps tell us a little more about that consolidation and how that is transforming the decision-making process to ensure consistency in the design and also in the implementation of fiscal and economic policies or such things as the ministry's strategic capacity for uh, expenditure allocation or the capacity for alignment of programs to multi-sector policies. Thank you, Camila. I hope you can hear me. Well, back to Portuguese. As I said before, answering the first question, in the beginning of um, Bolsonaro's uh, term, there was a diagnosis that we had over 30 uh, ministries, and there was an idea to reduce to at least 20 ministries which was the goal at that time. The, the, the aim was to optimize the, the management of public policies. A lot of times you have different subjects in different ministries and it's very hard to coordinate all these different uh, topics. I am a um, civil servant of the Ministry of Economy for more than 20 years and several times I saw very uh, how difficult it was to implement certain public policy because uh, topics there were in different ministries, even though there was some kind of coordination, very hard to be actually uh, brought to fruition. The, the goal was to uh, implement the reforms. We're able to merge certain ministries, at least three large ones, one for social policies, there is we call human rights, women, family, which is towards uh, social public policies. We have a minister uh, all mainly for the federation to deal with the issues related to the states and municipalities, what we call minister of regional development, which is a merging of the city ministry with the social institutions. So programs that we implement with the states, we have 26 states in Brazil together with the federal district. And we have the municipalities, we have 5,500 municipalities in Brazil. So those programs are more um, trying to emphasize and underscore the how to uh, coordinate with the states and municipalities. And then the Minister of Economy that we merged five different ministries that were pretty much working to implement public policy. So uh, the planning ministry, which was in charge of preparing our budget, but it was not the one in charge of executing the budget. This is, was the National Th Treasury. One was the Ministry of, of Planning and the other one economy. And a lot of times, several fiscal policies, how to fiscal consolidations are done with two ministries. When we merge them, we have a level of coordination much, much better in terms of planning our public expenditures and also the executions of those expenditures. This was one main optimizations that we were able to achieve with this merging. Second, we have the Minister of Economy which has as, as its uh, goal, which is the, the deal with pretty much the private sector and the Ministry of the Industry that creates some kind of protectionism. So the, we are talking about um, divergent uh, policies. So then the idea was to merge those two different views and trying to this public policy to implement or to enhance uh, more competence, improve the regulation, eliminate the red tape. So certain policies that were back then um, distinct, they are now working aligned together. And we still have a very, very close um, market economy in Brazil. We need to open that. And when we merge those two ministry, we were all working to uh, amplify our foreign trade. 
uh, jobs and economy. Sometimes we have a policy that are trying to diminish the level of hiring income, and the other one that is trying to uh, enhance or implement or certify certain uh, policies for rights for the employee. How can we all work together having the same, same goal, have more uh, jobs offering to the populations and improve the quality of life? So those functions that are a lot of different back then they were being coordinated by the same minister which is our minister of economy paulo Guedes, with the ability to merge and to have policy with the same goal with the same focus i'm not sure if i can share my screen i'm gonna try briefly Can you all see it? Yeah. Our main, uh, when we try to merge the ministries, we're trying to work together with certain reforms that must be coordinated. So first of all, the social security reform was the first one. We implemented here in Brazil, the largest one in the whole history in our social security system. With the help of, of the support of the population, the population went to the streets requesting and protesting in terms of having that social security reform. So we were able to translate that. The social re reform was to go against civil servants like myself with the kind of privilege that we have in our social security that are extremely onerous to the state. We're able to implement a very efficacious reform in 10 months, a debate that was going on forever in Brazil. And then we have all the other uh, front lines in terms of reform. The second one about the fiscal reform, how to enhance our uh, expenditures to use in a better way for the population. We have done uh, a good part of that, even during the pandemic, as my other colleagues explained the difficulties that they face, how to have a fiscal space to spend money uh, attending the needs of your population. So we're able to approve certain fiscal um, advancements that allow us in situations like such we can uh, spend the money necessary to have the resources for our population. And we also able to insert several important mechanisms to revise our fiscal system. We continue with our reforms with the agenda. We still have another two years. So we are debating this in now in the Congress. The administrative reform, the our civil servants, how to hire them for the government. It's already in Congress. It's a and we believe there is good will to debate, to discuss it, and have it approved in the next few months. So this is a priority right now in 2020. The tax reform for me is the most important one in terms to create, to generate more productivity and competitive to improve our business uh, environment here in Brazil. We have half of this reform already sent to the Congress and the the remainder will be sent towards uh, in a few months so we can debate. What do we want to do here? We want to show that we need to spend less uh, public expenditure. We need to spend in a better way, attending the needs of our population. At the same time, allow the private sector to invest more. We have to generate more in public private sector investment and less from the public sector. So the work together and coordinated with all these ministries allow this uh, idea. There is always a resistance um, to open the economy based on our tax system, in our uh, red tape. And the idea here is to show that we are trying to eliminate the red tape. We are trying to decrease the tax exports, improving uh, the business environment in Brazil and open our economy, reducing the import and export, allowing more import products and making it better for the foreign trade. It's a it's a it's a win-win situation. We also have the 
Oh, when the tax reform, as I said, the labor reform, which is also together with the tax report, we allow people to hire uh, more people to reduce the number of unemployment. It's something that we're debating for the following months, a new way to hire uh, employers so that we can reduce, again, the number of unemployed people in Brazil. And the privatizations and the um, PPPs, meaning the public uh, private partnerships. This is already going, you're already doing um, very important privatizations and we have other projects for the end, until the end of the year. Until next year, we are trying to execute the privatizations with Electrobus, which is an electric company and the mail, the, the mail, the, the mail uh, office, the post office actually. So that's very important programs that we rely to privatize. When you privatize, you use the money in a better way, having a more um, competitiveness without the interference of the federal government. And we also have a huge program for um, public and private partnerships. We are trying to implement this with investments with the private sector for several projects. And even during the pandemic, we continue to debate and study new possibilities, new projects, and executing some uh, uh, concessions. A few months ago, we were able to do that with railroads, ports, and airports. A very, very interesting uh, dispute with uh, international entities for participating in the concessions with the airports, even though we are facing a very hard time for uh, airports. So this new scheme of the ministry allow us to coordinate all these reforms. We can understand what is the proper time to implement some of those reforms and debate it with the Congress. And it, it makes it very easy for us, facilitate our debate uh, I have more and more work right now in the Ministry of the Economy when I have to coordinate with the different areas, but when we would send it to the Congress and then to the presidency, is already prepared, not only with all the several areas within the ministry, but also with the other reforms. It's very important that a tax reform be able to connect or coordinate with a labor reform as well with the trade opening, the market opening. Anyway, so the largest gain for our institutionality was to allow the coordination of these reforms and the ability to implement uh, bring them to fruition. We hope that next year we'll be able to approve or have them approve and continue the project of privatizations and PPP and um, um, opening our market. I think I've done. I think. Thank you very much. That is very important, very interesting. And this would be a good transition to talk to Secretary Rigo now because I think that it is interesting to compare the experience of Ecuador and Brazil with the experience of Argentina as far as the institutional reform of the Ministry of Finance, which has been exactly something that went in the opposite uh, sense. You have reduced our issues so that you could concentrate more on finance matters. And I would like you to tell us about your reform and what areas of the ministry has been strengthened thanks to the reform. And I would also like to know which are the challenges posed by this other type of institutional reform. Thank you so much, Camila. I believe that what I said in my last intervention, I think it is important to highlight the value of the document prepared by Edgardo and Alberto because it allows us to understand these two groups of functions, the traditional ones, the modern ones, the first that are related to ministries of finance, which were focused on control and the second group, it is for ministries of finance who are interested in the strategic use of resources for development. Before 
uh, speaking about the substance of this matter, I would like to indicate that in Argentina, the institutional and jurisdictional arrangements result in the fact that these modern functions are shared between the Ministry of Finance or the Economy and the Cabinet of Ministries. The Constitution gives the Cabinet a very important role as far as the administration, execution, and assessment of the budget. On this last issue, the budgetary assessment, as Edgardo was saying, in our view, I refer to the assessment of the budget, is the first step in order to assess the quality and the repercussion of public policies. And this is a very important step in our budgetary process. We naturally consider that this is associated and is based on the capacity that we may have to have specialized units with the professional profiles and the necessary expertise in order to carry out this quality assessment and the assessment of the repercussion of public policies. So the think that the assessment has a central role. It is a key element in the feedback of public policies. It is an indispensable element to improve one of the key functions of the national state, the allocation of public resources to improve the well-being of the population. So this assessment role for the budget and the measurement of the quality of public policies in Argentina is the most clear link between these two institutions, the Ministry of Finance or Economy and the Chief of the Cabinet. It is one of the most modern functions which are of the greatest importance and have more repercussions on public coffers. This also allows us to have information and to be transparent, have open governments and so forth. So this budgetary assessment function is central. Um, in with regard to this question, which I have the honor of replying to on behalf of Argentina, in this transition period, as mentioned by the study that we are examining today, this function and this transition of Argentina towards modern functions, I would say that three of these functions were the reform processes of the past two decades, or maybe three decades in Argentina, are consolidated. And they are related to the assessment and control of budgetary execution, information technology applied to the management of public finances, and the public finance statistics. These three functions, as the work done by Alberto and Edgardo are mature and consolidated functions in our country. As far as the potential to improve these three functions, we need to continue working together at the Ministry of Finance and all the organizations and public institutions in order to adopt international standards. I believe that this study very clearly highlights that this effort, this maturity of functions in the Argentinian public administration should be adapted to international standards. Would, could it be from the Open Government Partnership or the International Monetary Fund or any other institution? Because then 
we would be more systematic, we would have a better regulatory function for these institutions, which have already made good progress and have been consolidated. In something where we have lesser relative development amongst the modern functions, or with regard of the strategic use of resources for development, we have the issue of the management of fiscal risk. In Argentina, we have about 15 or 20 years of experience to have a framework of macro fiscal rules which are of a quantitative nature of uh, an acceptance by the federal government and the subnational governments, but without a doubt, this requires a sustained effort in order to improve their functional definition, their qualitative definition, and also in order to perfect institutional arrangements in order to precisely have a strategic sense in macro fiscal rules. We have to understand that a macro fiscal rule is not an end. It is a tool that allows us to give an intertemporary dimension to this in or to fiscal restrictions so that this could be an anchor for our development and for the growth of our markets and our economy. And these are precisely uh, the basis of the stability which we are striving to achieve. So I would say that the development of the concept and the institutionalization of this, the macro fiscal rules and the management of fiscal risk are a very interesting challenge which this Ministry of Finance, which has somehow set aside some traditional functions in order to focus its attention on the management of the budget is some a development for the next few years in our country we have a rule of fiscal responsibility which is part of a law which was approved by the federal and the provincial governments in 2005. There are organizations such as the Federal Council of Federal Responsibility, where there is a technical and political work concerning these rules, but we do have the possibility of improving upon this. The element which has it distinguished us and which has been a success in this reform, which made our ministry uh, concentrate on issues of public administration and turning it into a more modern institution uh, with functions that we are consolidating and intend to continue consolidating it has to do with the role of the Ministry of Finance as an ally to boost strategic alliances. We are a partner of all the, the cabinet, subnational governments, and all uh, government institutions. I believe that this is a key issue, and it is a stage in the development of our country after a long trajectory of reform, revision, and consolidation of its fiscal and budgetary management. As you well know, in 1992 in Argentina, we had a new bill of public administration in order to improve and streamline the dispositions that are part of this law have been our state policy during the past 25 years. Due to this, our budgetary system and the technology which we have been able to develop, and the IDB has been our partner in our ally 
to carry out this process. This has allowed us, as I was saying, to have systems which we call CINIF, the Integrated Financial Information System, which precisely helps us to use all the financial administration functions and put them all together. Our colleague from Ecuador was talking about the management, interoperability, the safety of the application and the use of public resources, taking into account the political priorities. And in that sense, I believe that we have managed to transform ourselves in an ally to drive strategic agendas. Let me provide an example which makes us very proud and which is a starting point for a new reform agenda. It has to do with one strategic agenda which has become extremely important, not only in our country, in our region, but in the whole world, which is the gender sensitive budget. How do we give a strategic vision to the budget, not in order to create a ministry that has to do with women, gender and diversity, which has also been a political measure, but what can we do to ensure that all public policies which are financed by the national budget should have activities and biases which help us to close the gender gaps throughout the entire budget and all the activities carried out by our society. What can we do to have public policy, public investment, public infrastructure? How can we make sure that we have a strategic view in order to close the gender gap. So uh, budgetary system such as the ECDF helps us to drive these strategic agendas because it gives us tools. And in this case, we have been able to label activities and programs which precisely help us to identify transversal policies, policies that do not have the traditional vision of associating a policy to one ministry, to one jurisdiction, and to consider that policy or that uh, program will contribute towards that goal. What we're trying to see is how to open up the Zoom and how can we make sure that this is across all ministries and organizations and bodies to contribute towards the, for instance, the gender sensitive budget. So with the labeling, which is a practical and simple tool from the point of view of IT, in each budgetary program, we can identify all the activities that contribute towards this strategic objective. So it is possible to analyze and obtain data and produce information that will let us know through the assessment how these budgetary allocation are contributing towards the strategic achievement of policies, for instance, the gender sensitive budget and what will be done in the future. And this is something that we have to do in the short term. So how can we contribute towards other strategic agendas? For instance, that have to do with childhood that may have to be related to climate change that could be related to the environment. So it, this is an innovative vision, a fresh vision, an effective vision precisely to find in each budgetary program the activities that will contribute towards a goal that is a cross-cutting edge, which is interesting for the society. And then it will allow us from the management of public resources to let our legislators, the society and the citizens and the responsible people for these public policies 
how we can have information that is provided in a timely manner and that is faithful to show how we are working towards the achievement of these strategic goals. Finally, I think that this is extremely interesting in the economies and countries such as Argentina and other countries of the region where we still have some pending assignments as far as equity, progressivity. We need to guarantee that the resources that the society is devoting to the financing of priority public policies, the effectiveness of these public policies and the ob obtaining results which have positive results on the population, for instance, reducing gender violence, reducing the gender gap, and have the same opportunity for women and different genders. This is really a fundamental achievement. We think that this is a great challenge. We will continue working with the macro fiscal rules and the management of fiscal rules and these things which are absolutely related to the drive for agendas information transparency so that the government and the citizens should know that we have attained the strategic goals we were trying to attain thank you so much secretary rigo it is very interesting. I wanted to point out the role of ministries of finance to drive policies and strategic agendas. Mr. Minister Yamosas, based on what Secretary Rigo was saying, and also based on the ECLAC and IDB publication, one of the modern functions of ministries of finance is precisely this one, the coordination, articulation, design, and public policies. I would like you to tell us which institutional reforms or which mechanisms have you implemented in the Paraguayan Ministry of Finance in order to implement the government priorities? Thank you very much for that question on coordination. As soon as the new government took office in uh, institutional, interinstitutional or interagency um, committees were planned, both including public and private sector components, so as to look at public expenditure on the one hand and at the tax component. And based on the experience of the first committee that was established and that led to a reform of our tax system, we have actually promoted the work of this interagency committee that is extremely important in supporting the analysis and proposals for best practices in terms of planning, management, and also control of public expenditure with a focus on enhancing the quality and efficiency of expenditure in government. This includes a Ministry of Finance, representatives of Congress, of the Advisory Council, including former uh, ministers, and representatives of government and civil society to discuss the significant challenges to improve the efficiency in spending. Much has been implemented and other things are still underway, but we are convinced that the best way is to pursue this dialogue further and encourage the needed institutional reforms, creating consensus between the public and private sectors and also uh, engaging citizens at large. During the first phase, the focus was on analyzing the context of, of public finances, including meetings with international uh, institution experts, including from the IDB, like Alejandro Exierdo and Carola Pesino, who presented some salient features of the book on better spending for better lives. So as to have a diagnosis of the situation, and in that way, agree amongst the members on the main areas for intervention in the short, medium, and long terms. 
The measures suggested by the committee had an impact on public procurement, on results-based management, on the uh, remuneration policy in the public sector, and also on the pension uh, sector. Based on this, we have sought to enhance the utilization of social security resources to um, invest them in a way that brings even more resources. And we're also working with a uh, proposal to comprehensively overhaul the system to ensure its sustainability going forward and to have a superintendency of pensions as a regulatory body that our country does not currently have. And in 2020, we also work to replace the strictly financial view or approach to the budget by implementing a new budgetary methodology based on results, providing a different perspective so as to raise the visibility of the resources allocated to uh, dealing with issues that have an impact on the living conditions of population using performance indicators that will help us evaluate the results of public policies. We have betted on the predictability of the budget, taking a more medium term view instead of an annual view, including planning and budgeting as part of a unified process, also enhancing transparency in the use of public resources. We now have a platform, uh, the accountability platform, specifically designed for citizens to access information on the uh, spending that goes into the uh, needs posed by the current situation. And citizens can see the progress of government interventions in the context of COVID, and this will be applied to the whole universe of our budget so that every Paraguayan citizen may have real-time information as to how public resources are being used. As part of the state modification process, we are working on the design of a new Ministry of Economy, and in this regard, the IDB through Lea, Edgardo, and the great team at the bank, they're all helping us to strengthen fiscal institutions, uh, strengthening the traditional functions on tax collection, re the allocation of resources, and the design of public policies, while at the same time strengthening areas such as the quality of spending, the management of fiscal risks, and also the income policy, in addition to enhanced planning and coordination of multi-sectoral policies, coordinating fiscal and economic policy within the digitalization of public finances while ensuring efficient management of uh, both tax and customs resources, uh, also looking at investments and the focus on structural reforms and cooperation across all is key in order to recover pre-pandemic levels and to improve management for the sake of better services and goods for our society. So those are some of the main areas we are focusing on. And we are certainly encouraging a reform agenda that will take us back to the uh, sustainability levels in public finances that we had before the pandemic and also to enable sustainable and inclusive growth. Thank you very much, Minister Zamosas. Due to our limited time, I would like to conclude this panel with one final question for Vice Minister Medrano. Amongst the main modern functions of ministries of finance, and I think this came up in each of the interventions we've heard so far, reference has been made to the capacity for evaluation of the quality and efficiency of public spending as a critical function at this juncture. Panama has in recent years been working to strengthen its capacities on different fronts. In line with this, could you tell us about the institutional arrangements that the ministry has put in place to improve its capacity for evaluation of public policies and spending? Thanks very much for the uh, new opportunity to speak. Let me first say that the Ministry of the Economy and Finance in Panama is the result of the merger of the Ministry of Finance and Treasury 
and the former Ministry of Planning and Economic Policy. Why do I mention this? Because our organizational structure and our solutions cover a wide range that is organizationally divided into two vice ministries, the one of economy and the one of finance. The vice ministry of economy houses the budget office of the country, which is one of the functions specified in the law creating the ministry of economy and finance. The public financing office deals with financing and support for um, draft budgets and it is currently very well organized with a great reputation both professionally and in terms of performance and we are working to ensure that the funding is directed and allocated on the basis of green financing experiences while encouraging the development of the local securities market. This also houses the investment planning office as well as the project management office and the public policies office, which is very important and is closely linked going forward to coordination tasks and also engaging with uh, sector ministries uh, with regard to social policies and also to the coordination of economic policies. And let me add that the issue of planning and of the strategic vision was never abandoned in the context of the merger, but in recent decades, we have seen a weakening of that function. And that is precisely one of the things we are coming back to and which we think significantly relates to the topic that has gathered us here regarding the control, um, from the control to the strategic utilization of public resources and the Territorial Planning Office was created in February and intersects with the Planning Institute. And all of this will be discussed in our Congress and due to time constraints, um, we weren't able to finalize that in the last uh, congressional session. But the Planning Institute will act in coordination with other offices with a focus on the strategic vision that is precisely what our colleague from Argentina clearly highlighted. The idea being to manage links to fiscal discipline, the social responsibility law, and how this dovetails with the structuring of annual budgets and how that budget office works, so as to basically strengthen the modern functions that have been highlighted today, so as to move towards an evaluation and to results based budgeting in addition to the multi-annual scheduling of objectives within the context of the broader strategic vision. Having all of that, I think, helps us in our work. We are strengthening the financial programming of the government sector, and all of these offices have a role to play. And of course, we also engage in coordination with the central government as a whole and the non-financial public sector. But I would especially like to mention, apart from the Territorial Development Office, to the 
importance in terms of linkages and of engaging with the political levels throughout the country against the backdrop of the decentralization process in municipalities and in uh, local districts, which also helps improve the coordination of efforts across the social ministries and the Ministry of Economy and Finances. When it comes to resources that are earmarked for areas where we uh, have identified the greatest uh, poverty and vulnerability with all of the attendant work that is being done in order to channel efforts and subsidies in the context of the pandemic and to also improve the targeting of subsidies so that we the idea is not to cut back, but really to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of each dollar that goes into the subsidies, while at the same time modernizing the approach to subsidies, seeking alternatives that will help us to cushion the blow and setbacks that the pandemic has brought about in terms of poverty. We are at 20% poverty overall with extreme poverty, mainly in indigenous communities. But the um, setback has been considerable. And at the Vice Ministry of Finance, there's also the General uh, Revenue Office, which does the uh, collection. And we are also working to upgrade our budgetary management, improving the automation of processes, services as well, streamlining processes and taxpayer service so as to improve performance. Panama has very low uh, tax burden levels and has even brought down those levels in recent years. And now we need to review that, not necessarily in terms of conceiving a uh, tax reform, but rather we are in the process of identifying opportunities for better collection by raising tax on activities that are currently not taxed. And all of that work has to go hand in hand with efficient use of resources by improving the quality of spending. And we are dedicating a substantial amount of time, and we know time is precious, to really improve, but always with a long-term view. And of course, these processes are not free of flaws and weaknesses. Uh, political processes and the possibility of joining efforts, building consensus, and also reaching out to the population to put in place social contracts, as some have said, so that everyone can embrace a shared vision going forward. But when it comes to decision-making, there are some line items that we consider to be strategic. For example, keeping in place efforts to improve educational health, which is important to enhance our human capital and also encouraging the general use of technologies and digitalization. And the Government Innovation Authority has been playing and will continue to play a key role in supporting the modernization process across all sectors. And that is something that we are focusing on as part of the other tasks. And some of you have also referred to this. Some time ago, we created 
a public-private partnership office within the um, president's office. And a law was adopted by this administration. It regulates PPPs and the Ministry of Economy and Finance plays a role here to create a technical team or cluster to support PPPs. And we have been working on this since last year already, so as to have professionals from the public financing sector as well as from the investment fields and public policies so that they are familiar with best practices and success PPP stories in other countries. And in this way, carry out projects in that direction. And important here is the fact that uh, treasury, accounting, and uh, assets, all of those offices are within uh, finance. So this highlights the role of the Ministry of Economy and Finance, which in the last 20 to 25 years has been important for the purpose of serving as an incubator for institutions that are now firmly installed in the banking sector. For instance, the Banking Commission was born in this context. Following a financial sector reform, we put in place the supervision elements, which is banking, insurance, and securities. This has enhanced our structure. And in recent years, the superintendency of non-financial uh, persons has also was created. And also, also this intersects with other matters that we need to deal with, such as gray lists that we are working on consistently in order to rebuild our image. And these kinds of institutions allow us to better deal with requests sent to us by international organizations such as the OECD or the EU, so as to quickly um, get over the gray list. There are two elements which were mentioned here. We believe that it is st of strategic importance to boost the energy program. And in this ministry, we were part of the what was called Commission for Energy. Today, it's a Secretariat for Energy. And we are developing and driving the energy transition, which is fundamentally important in our economic reactivation program and also the importance of coordinating public policies with all the aspects that are related to commitments of the environment uh, agreements such as the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, and we need to make sure at this time have, we have an initiative of access to green funds in order to obtain resources to study uh, pre-investment studies. We are also thinking about developing new initiatives in this sense. The role of the state of and of public administration during the pandemic has shown the important role which we have to carry out with different parts of the society. This is why we are convinced that the experience of the pandemic has been useful to understand 
what needs to be done in order to renovate, in order to obtain a sustainable development, to make changes of constant improvement. We have to invest in technology, simplify bureaucracy and the use of telework, which has also been an important element to sustain and maintain state services without interruption. And that is all I will say, because I know that we have no more time. I thank you once again for the opportunity to give you an overview of the work we are carrying out, which these are the functions which are part of the elements that have been shared here. And we need to continue sharing our experiences in order to have an important benchmark with regard to the different tasks and the attainment of our objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Minister Medrano. In order to close this panel, first of all, I would like to thank the members of our panel for their participation in this discussion. This has been an extremely rich space as far as the exchange of experiences and we all have an important uh, messages of institutional reforms of these institutions which are a basic for the development of our countries such as ministries of finance thank you very much thank you so much to our specialist camila mejia for being a moderate of this high level panel and i thank once again the panelists for their interventions i would now like to give the floor once again to lea jimenez the chief of the ics division of the idb to close this seminar thank you very much this has been uh, an event which has exceeded our expectations due to the high level of the interventions we have heard and to our rich exchanges so we're most grateful as we have mentioned modernization and strengthening of our ministries of finance is a strategic and factor for the development of our countries we all have work to do including those countries that now have the highest institutional development they have the challenge of maintaining and improving what they have already attained the modernization of ministries of finance is absolutely necessary in order to solve issues including those that come from the crisis that we have due to the pandemic the strengthening of these ministries is especially important in emergency contexts such due to the capacity required so that the institutions should be able to coordinate the state and the reaction of the state in a timely manner it has been of key importance to hear about the regional experience and we have heard those who have been leaders in this process i would thank very much the ministries secretaries vice ministries who were with us during the last panel without any doubt their experience has been very important for this uh, webinar and has shown us what the challenges are and which are the opportunities that we have when we modernize the ministries of finance. Those of us who are linked directly or indirectly with institutional reforms have the opportunity to have programs that will help us reap more solid institutions with the capacity to generate better public policies oriented towards regional development and to improve the quality of life of all our citizens that is our major goal thank you to all of you for your participation i wish you a very good afternoon it has been an honor the inter-american development bank is very honored to have had your participation in this event. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon.